Great. Now it is my pleasure to introduce the panelists for this afternoon's roundtable. Lee Daniels, class of 1971, is a journalist and author who has written for the Washington Post, the New York Times, the National Urban League, and the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund. And he's also the author of several books. Give it up for Lee Daniels, please. <laughs> Jeff Howard, class of 69, is the founder and president of the Efficacy Institute, which promotes the academic and social development of children by providing guidance to educators, parents, and human service providers. He also holds a PhD in social psychology from Harvard University, Jeff Howard. Octavia Hudson, class of 1971, is the CEO of We All Media. She's worked to affect change in a variety of fields, including politics and public policy, media, human service organizations, philanthropy, and education. Welcome. <laughs> Orlando Patterson is the Cal's professor of sociology at Harvard. He's the winner of the National Book Award for Nonfiction and holds the Order of Distinction Commander Class from the government of his native Jamaica. Orlando Patterson. <laughs> and finally, Henry Rusovsky. Henry is the Geyser University Professor Emeritus here at Harvard, where he served as Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Sciences between 1973 and 1984, and then again uh, between 1990 and 1991, when the last two people he brought to Harvard were Kwame Anthony Apia and me. Give it up for Henry Rosowski. <laughs> Congratulations. Great. Um, so Jeff, take us back to April 1968, here on the Harvard campus in the aftermath of the assassination of Dr. King. How did the black students on campus respond? And what were the now famous four demands that they made of the university that spring? Oh, you're not going to quiz me on the four demands, I hope. <laughs> um, we, we were children of the civil rights movement. Not that most of us had been directly engaged, but we were beneficiaries. The civil rights movement opened the doors. Harvard responded to the Civil Rights Movement, and I think particularly the March on Washington, by realizing that there was a population of us out there that needed to be part of the broader stream of American culture. So Harvard did a great job. We had all been good students in high school, and, and, and in, the, in the, the sort of wake of the Civil Rights Movement, we all arrived here. Martin King was killed in 1968. Now, we were actively organized. We had the Association of African and Afro-American Students which had been set up by previous classes. I believe it was started by an African student in the early 1960s and was already here when we arrived. And what year did you come? I came in 1965. And how many black kids were in your class? There were 40 in my class. 40. There were 30 in the previous class. Mm -hmm. um, that was the class that was directly impacted by the March on Washington. So Harvard opened up and went from maybe 10 students many of whom were African and not African-American, mm -hmm. to 30 African-American students the year before I got here, 40 in my class, 50 in the next class. And we decided they were probably going to hold it at 50 because they held it for another couple of years at, at 50. Mm -hmm. We felt, just a, just a quick moment about the context. Um, we were from black communities. Uh, I was from a black community. A lot of us were not from elite communities. My father was a policeman. My mother was a homemaker. Probably Octavia has a similar story. A lot of us came from the people. And we had all been struck, I think, coming up about the paucity of our representation in American culture. Growing up in Chicago, you would see black folks in the newspaper, in the metro section, when they committed a crime. And that was about all. So a thrust, I think, that we felt after King's death, uh, and probably it started before that, but it culminated after Martin Luther King's death, was for recognition. 
We want it to be seen and recognized as an important part of American society. And the department seemed to be a vehicle for that. Uh, it didn't take much to get us organized around it. We all believed in it. And we encountered people like Dean Rosowski, who, although he did not always agree with us, in a real sense mentored us in how to think about it and how to understand it. Uh, I had a mentor, a personal mentor, Adelaide Cromwell. Many of you might have known her. Sure. She was the head of African American Studies at Boston University for many years. Yeah. She just passed away six months ago at age 99. But she mentored us. So I had Adelaide talking to me in one year, uh, meetings with Dean Rosofsky and Alan Heimert and other representatives of the university in the other. And we talked to each other. And we concluded that a department was what we really wanted, and that's what we negotiated for. And what year did you graduate? 69. In 69. The, the, the class at Yale, I went to Yale, the, the class that graduated in 66 had six black men. The class that entered with me in 69 had 96. Wow. So the same. Same trajectory. Yeah, the same trajectory. And Harvey and Yale were looking at each other and calling each other and saying, how many are you going to let in? Yeah, I think, I think they were. <laughs> and we're going to do the same thing. Uh, Lee, now I understand that you ended up going to Dr. King's funeral. Um, how did that come about? And how did you see the issue of the assassination and the cause of black studies linking up at that time? And please tell us when, when you came, what class you were in, and how many black kids were in your class? I was in the class of 71, and there were, as near as we can figure, 43 uh, black boys in the class of 71. The major advance was in Octavia's uh, group. Uh, women were admitted to Radcliffe um, separately then. And there were 13 or 15? 17, I believe. There were 17 women at Radcliffe, 17 black women admitted, which was more than triple the number uh, that had been admitted in the previous class. Uh, Radcliffe had been admitting admitting one to two to three black women per class since the early 1900s. And suddenly it jumped in the late uh, 1960s. Um, so my class was, um, in some ways, we were the whole group from 67, I would say the class of 67 to the class of 71. We were, in a sense, um, the end of the beginning, mm -hmm. in that we were not pioneers, but we came to a Harvard that had not really changed all that much since the early 1900s. Yeah. After King's assassination, Harvard, uh, in terms of the black student population, would change enormously. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, I had, I think, an advantage over many other students in that I had grown up in Boston. Um, I had gone to Boston Latin School, um, for those of you who know it, um, is a very, was a very, in my day, a very Harvard-centric school. If you were at all a good student, uh, you were pushed to apply to Harvard. Uh, it, it was an all-boys school then. Uh, boys who um, uh, came from Boston Latin School were admitted to Harvard on par with in terms of numbers on par with Exeter, Exeter and Andover. Um, and um, for those of you who know, um, Boston Latin School was founded one year before Harvard. Uh, <laughs> and so we had all this history and tradition, um, even though the school itself for all of the 20th century up until that time was a school for boys from primarily the working class and the lower middle class. So how'd you get in? <laughs> uh, well, they, they did admit a few uh, black students. Uh, you have to remember, Boston's black population into the late 1960s was only 9% of the total population. Um, Let's wait one second. Yeah. Hmm. Boston's black population was only 9% of the total population. Um, so this was a, a community of blacks and whites. Um, there were, uh, the Asian American population was roughly one to two percent, overwhelmingly Chinese American. There were almost no uh, Latinx people in Boston, literally. Um, and 
I grew up in a community, in a city, of course, that was Harvard-focused, even though it was a working-class city, beneath all the gloss of the high culture institutions, and a deeply segregated and yet uh, peaceful, but beginning to rock uh, because of the school desegregation agitation. And um, Boston had a long tradition of the, what we used to call the free Negro community, the free black community. And, and, if, and if you take the black history trail, it's like seeing the slave narratives come to life because many of the authors of slave narratives lived here. And of course, Phyllis Wheatley lived here, who was the first black po poet in English in, in history. And the, the small black community in Boston had its own tradition that went back to colonial times. And of course, Du Bois was a, an enormously significant force in the black community, aside from Harvard. Uh, his memory, and William Monroe Trotter had only died in the late, in the um, late 1930s, actually. And his sister carried on the tradition. So this history was very much alive in the city of Boston. Uh, and in the black community, and it was a deeply Harvard tradition mm -hmm. as well. Uh, how I got to King's funeral. <laughs> when um, uh, King was killed during vacation week at Harvard that year, uh, when students got back on campus and the university was holding its memorial service here in Memorial Church, and Quadruple AS was holding its memorial service out on the veranda, I was standing with three other black students, Ed Maddox, David Karande, and Ben Willis. For some reason, we didn't join the group on the veranda. We were simply observing. And then one of us said, well, the funeral's tomorrow. Harvard ought to send a delegation. OK, let's go talk to Fred. Fred being Fred Glimp, who was then dean of students. Dean of the college. Dean of the college. Fred had his office in University Hall. Fred was a charmer. Um, he was this great looking guy, he almost looked kind of Hollywood star quality. <laughs> uh, knew a lot of students, was very approachable. So we turned and walked into University Hall, walked into his office, uh, and asked his secretary if we could see Fred Glenn. And Fred shouted out through the door, send him in. We walked in and we said, you know, Harvard ought to send a delegation from Afro <laughs> to, um, to the funeral tomorrow in Atlanta. It's only proper. And we volunteer. <laughs> no, no. What happened was Fred looked at us, then he punched the uh, button on his intercom and said to his secretary, whose name I've forgotten, but said, could you get four airline round trip tickets to Atlanta and reservations at the Portman Hotel in Atlanta for Lee Daniels, Ed Maddox, Sewi Karande, and Ben Willis. That's a great story. And we were dumbfounded <laughs> because we had not thought it would be us, seriously. We thought it would be the leadership. And we started to explain to Fred that, and he cut us off and he said, no, the leadership is going to be busy here on campus. <laughs> You guys are here now, and the funeral is tomorrow, and you've got to get to Atlanta, so you've got to go. And you've probably got about an hour and a half to catch the plane. <laughs> so see, see my secretary on the way out, and come back to get your tickets, and, and that's how we got there. Uh, arriving. <laughs> and, and at least some members of the leadership never heard that story. <laughs> I bet the leadership was not amused. <laughs> if we had known, we might not have been amused. Leadership was not that busy. <laughs> it, it, was a, it was a chaotic time. Claudine, um, Claudine, you hear that? You just push a button, four tickets appear, <laughs> go to Atlanta. <laughs> so that's how we got there. Uh, the, the funeral in Atlanta was, um, we were on the street um, uh, near uh, the Morehouse College campus where the funeral was held. Um, and uh, it was um, the most crowded event I've ever been at, uh, even though I've been at a lot of crowded events. 
uh, there was the freneticism of that moment in Atlanta was extraordinary. Octavia, how did the students translate the energy coming off these bigger issues in the wider society into finding a voice, particularly as a young African-American woman, trying to find your voice in the Harvard community, but also within a black male dominated community. A very young, a very young, young woman. Yeah. Yes, indeed. <laughs> and how, how were you treated by them, uh, by the black guys on campus, when you were insisting on having a voice in the shaping of black studies too? Well, I mean, to be, to be truthful, I didn't really insist on having a voice. Uh, I think that in the history of talking about the department, um, sometimes it's lost how it evolved. And I don't think as many people recognize the part that Jeff played mm -hmm. in making sure and insisting that it was a department. Now, I've heard both of them talk about, you know, coming to Harvard, and it's just my nature that I've always felt comfortable anywhere I chose to be. So I was not, in the sense, you know, upset about whether or not I had good leadership. Jeff was a good leader. Mm -hmm. And it was, in many cases, it was his saying, well, Octavia, why don't you um, be the, one of the people on the committee? I don't want to take any credit that's not due me. But at the same time, what we did as talking about the women who came to Radcliffe, we were very more concerned about quality of life issues. And I can remember sitting um, with Lonnie Guineer and several others in um, um, President Bunting's office talking about the need for the Kumba singers. Mm -hmm. And um, well, that was one of the quality of life issues that we were interested in. And then there was an African dance class that we had uh, that the guys loved because we were you know, scantily dressed, bouncing around. <laughs> they liked that. But it was, it was more those quality of life. And then when he got to the question of the department, I think it's really important to recognize how insistent and how systematic they were the, in, under Jeff's leadership of making sure that we were talking about having a department and the importance of having a legacy and something that lasted. Yes. And I did indeed just um, do what, I got on the committee because Jeff said so. <laughs> but I did it because, uh, I mean, I'm not getting back to the question you asked, I'm not the type of person that if I didn't think he was a good leader, I would have done it. I wouldn't have done it. We can tell. <laughs> <laughs> but, the, but the point I think is, 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 is important is that I was never quite sure how best to navigate Harvard. Mm -hmm. Intellectually, I loved the place. It was a place where Widener Library, I would say it to, to, to this day, is a place where you can go and learn whatever you want to learn. I was never so involved in coursework that I didn't learn what I wanted to learn. And at the time, I don't hope it's the same way, you could also go um, and audit whatever courses you wanted. And I audited all kinds of courses because it, it suited me. But culturally, I never thought that Harvard was the healthiest place for folks because I, think, I thought it molded people into something that wasn't necessarily who they wanted to be, but it was their desire to be a part of the group. And so if, I know it's one of the questions you're going to ask later, but I think it's really important to talk about in the future how you can preserve your culture mm -hmm. and at the same time, you know, connect to your humanity. Right. And the degree to which um, Harvard, the department can help with that, I don't know. I mean, Jeff was always very um, much interested and the need to change institutions and make them work for community. Mm -hmm. How well that happens, I don't know. I don't have the answer to that. Well, it might surprise you to know, I, I think I could be, um, one of um, Claudine or, or Larry or Tommy can correct me, but I think there are now 15 black student organizations in Harvard College. Is that right? It's something that from my day, I was secretary of the BSAY, the Black Student Alliance at Yale, it was hard enough having one organization. We're getting enough folks to come to one meeting. There are more black organizations than any of us ever could have conceived. But I want to, before I go to Henry, 
I want to bounce off what you, you just said. Because I want to ask you, how in the world, how old were you, 19, 20, when you figured out that it needed to be a department, not a committee or a program? I was 20, but, and remember, I was mentored. Mm -hmm. I trusted Adelaide Cromwell. I came to trust Henry Rosatsky. Mm -hmm. um, there were, Harvard, Harvard was filled with people who had integrity. Mm -hmm. And although we didn't always agree, you felt that integrity. And when you talk to a man like this, you had the sense that he was telling it like he saw it. Sure. And you could take it or leave it, but, but, but he was telling you the truth. And it was a matter of trying to put together all these various perspectives, talking with my great colleagues in Afro, and us coming to a conclusion together based on all of that input. But you, the fact that it was a department made it possible for Anthony and for me to come here with a structure already in place. Yeah. At Yale, Yale only became a department because Harvard, because we came and regenerated Afro-American The, decision, black studies the decision looks pretty that. good right now. And I got to say, you know, I come back here every 10 years or so. I mean, I went off and lived my life after I graduated. Went to graduate school and wasn't really connected. I knew something about what the department was, was going through and what was happening, but not in detail. And coming back here every once in a while was like a, a low-frequency strobe light, OK? Every 10 years, you get a flash, and like it's really different. Right. And then 10 years later, it's really developed. I was, frankly, amazed at, the, at, the, at the, the speech you two guys made today about where this department is, all the people that it has spun out into the university and into the world. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful thing, and, and we're, feeling, we're feeling pretty good. <laughs> well, yeah. Yes. Yes, I may. Well, one way to answer, also to answer sure. your question, is that we had role models. When you talked about how young we were and thinking about organizing, developing institutions, we had role models, and that the Civil Rights Movement provided role models of young people taking on and attempting to reshape That's right. institutions. Right. right? And y young people who did not wait, right, until they either had their degrees or were older or whatever. But young people, and some of them were younger than we were, who were taking on institutions. So they were, we, we grew up with that as a role model. Mm -hmm. right. But friends of yours, um, you know, there were so few black kids in the Ivy League, we would have what we called spook weekends, remember? Super spook weekends. Yeah, super spook weekend. But the black kids from Harvard come down to New Haven, or we'd come up and we'd hang out on, on, on the weekends together. So the same group of people were at Yale, and the best they got was a program. And that caused endless misery because people would come up for tenure in the program of Afro-American studies, and they couldn't get it. But they could get it here, if, at least theoretically. Well, one, one of the things, though, that I, I think, think is important to, um, to keep in mind, and for me was a great learning experience when I was here, is to understand some of the politics. Um, Jeff and I were in the same PhD program, and um, it used to have a saying that you could um, do change in two different ways. You could either change institutions or build your own institutions. Mm -hmm. Much of what the emphasis is here is to, um, you know, change the institution, and, and that, has, that has done well, right? Be people have changed the institution. But in terms of understanding the politics of it, it wasn't just something that simply happened. Uh -huh. There was resistance to the idea oh. of a department. There was great resistance. Mm -hmm. And I'm not com completely sure about all of your politics, because it's just that I went off and lived my life. But as you had talked about Ephraim Isaacs earlier, these are people who were committed to the idea of a department. And in those last words of the, um, the, uh, uh, the Negro ads anthem, of spirit, you know, our God and our country. Right. Um, True to our native land. land. And our native land. Ephraim was, to me, one of the people that was really helped build the, the, the department in terms of students who were interested in the spirit. Right. And if we're going to have a department that isn't, if you are going to have a department, because I'm not here yet, and the children who will come after me, it's very important, I think, to 
have real clarity about our cultural values. Absolutely. And if we're going to connect with community, if that's a possibility, that's what I meant about I don't know, then we should have some understanding about the politics of how that works oh. and have some understanding about ourselves as to those of us who may want to be more in community and those who are here and want to maintain the kind of scholarship mm -hmm. that can help us learn how to do better. But I think that's something that we need to think about for ourselves to make the, the department something that works for not just us here, here. and other people. Well, I'm not sure you know, but yeah, yeah. Evelyn, uh, Evelyn Higginbotham, when mm -hmm. she was chair, mm -hmm. um, pioneered in a, a track called social engagement, mm -hmm. um, going back to the roots of, of the field with the students. Mm -hmm. So that in addition to concentrating in English or history or whatever, you can have a social uh, mm -hmm. engagement track. If, I don't know if you've all been to, have been to the department, um, and, which is you know, um, where you all used to eat, <laughs> the <laughs> yes. freshman year. Right, that's right. But um, the, the photograph of the ad hoc committee, uh, whatever it was officially called, all the photographs are there. Every student who comes in sees the photographs of the student pioneers who insisted on the departmental structure. And, and it's funny to see all your pictures from like 50 years ago. You know, it's, you haven't changed very much. Uh, you haven't changed very much at all. Um, which brings me to, oh, and by the way, we give, among the several prizes that are given at commencement, one is in honor of Ephraim Isaacs for the pioneering role that he's played. And by the way, since Sean Mugani um, started the African language program, 5,000 students at Harvard have studied African language. And I didn't mean it, uh, be clear, I did not mean it as a criticism. I think that what you have done with this department is something to celebrate. I mean, you've take, taken it from an idea and made it something. I'm just saying that students who come through can use the history of the department as well as the accomplishments of the department in order to decide where they want to be in their lives. Right. How much of the engagement, because everybody is not going to be engaged in community. No. That's an unrealistic expectation. Right. But those who do, you can help give them background you can help give them a kind of, I, that's what I appreciated a lot. I learned a lot about politics here at Harvard <laughs> that I took into the world oh, that yeah, helped. That's right. you know, and so that's, and, it, it, and if there's a way to um, also talk about how you deal with culture in that regard, mm -hmm. because as an African American, a descendant of slaves in this country, very often I think the blacks who came here to Harvard or just came to university often come with a feeling of inferiority or, or, or the idea that they've, they've got to fit in, they've got to change, as opposed to celebrating the successes and the fact that the things that we have done as descendants of slaves in this country has been an inspiration to, to Africans all over the, the world, blacks all over the world. Right. And we need to carry that with us because if we just completely forget about our culture, there's not much we're going to be able to do because no. we'll never have the um, confidence that we need to accomplish the changes in our communities that are so critically needed. I think that's the foundation Absolutely. upon which my 40 other colleagues and I right. implicitly right. stand. Right. I think you're absolutely right. Woe to the black person who does not understand the history of anti-black racism in Western civilization. Because mm -hmm. we tell our students, one day you, you rise up quickly, your head hits something, you don't know what it is and you almost pass out. That is anti-black racism. And no matter how smart you are, no matter how rich you are, no matter what, you are gonna hit your head upside against white racism. And now, more blatantly than I think in, in, a, in a very long time. Henry, you chaired what has become known famously as the Rosofsky which in 68 69 explored the question of the future of black studies at Harvard. Can you tell us, if you will, a little about the members of your committee, what its mission was, and how it reached its recommendation? Uh, let me begin by, uh, on a personal note, if that's all right. Mm -hmm. uh, when Dr. King was assassinated, I wrote a letter to 
Franklin Ford, the dean, and basically urging uh, African American studies. My letter talked about students, uh, made the point that you can't really have more African American faculty members unless you have more graduate students, etc. Because the next thing, inevitable, he asked me to chair the committee that was set up. Um, the other thing I, I want to say, a lot of people believe that African American studies was a kind of political accommodation, you know, to satisfy the militants. I was, from the very beginning, I think, uh, of a rather, of a completely different view. Because this is kind of accidental, but I had a strong interest in African American culture from the days of my childhood in Europe. I happened to be a great jazz fan. And, well, it's not a laughing, you know, the whole world, as I think I wrote, dances to African American music. I mean, what is there? And, and that has not changed. <laughs> that has not changed, no. And uh, so in a sense, I understood what this was all about and what we were doing was not just simply to keep militant students satisfied. I had a deep belief in the validity of the subject. You know, the first serious book about jazz was written by a Frenchman, Tanassier. It's called Le Jazz Hot. Louis Armstrong was asked what he thought of the book, and he said, do I tell a Frenchman how to jump on a grape? <laughs> but that is a historical <laughs> footnote. <laughs> what I did not realize, and you know, we are talking about events that were 50 years ago. I mean, I look at these young people on my right, and I sort of see that they have changed a bit, and <laughs> I have probably uh, changed uh, even more. And the issue was, you know, I did not appreciate sufficiently the political importance of what we were doing. I and a few others, and actually, I would say Martin Kilson was rather close to my view. We wanted to set up absolutely the best and, in a sense, cleanest academic program possible. And I, when I sit here now, 50 years later, and I see what people are saying and what their deep beliefs are, I say to myself, you know, this was a hell of a lot more than just an academic program. Uh, that's important. Now, our, the people on our committee, my memory fails me, we had, uh, well, Martin Kilson was on it. Can you think of some others? No. Chico? <laughs> Chico, that's right. Ernie Wilson. Ernie Wilson. Yes, Ernie Wilson Ernie was Wilson. a student. Yes. Chico. 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 Yeah. That's terrible. Anyway. Uh, Is Henry Clavel on the committee? Someone mentioned to me. Who? Uh, Cl Clavel? No, Stanley? Stanley was not. Stanley. He wasn't. No, he was not. no. Clavel. No. Uh, no. Stuart Hughes? H. Stuart Hughes? He might have no, he was on the successor committee. I don't remember. Oh, I have a list here. Okay. <laughs> if, uh, one one minute. Andy, I have, can you Google who was on that committee? <laughs> I, don't have it, I have it right here. Okay. I think Seth right. Stewart. C. W. Curl, Daniel Fox, George Gothels, Alan Heimert, Stuart Hughes, Martin Kilson, uh, Gary Marks, J. W. M. Whiting, and those are the faculty members. How many are still alive? Uh, not very many. 
the thing is, we recommended, as everybody, and I think, if you don't know the background, it wouldn't have come out in the histories. And uh, we recommended, among many other things, a degree, undergraduate degree program that was based on history and literature and social studies. I mean, two of the finest undergraduate programs at Harvard. Uh, and this, initially, everybody was quite satisfied with this. And you know, the demand for a department really became much more vocal after the takeover of University Hall and the meeting in the football stadium. That, that was SDS, that wasn't us. No, no, I'm, that was, no, no. yes. <laughs> Uh, but, actually, and, but that proved ahead, to be the, the biggest contention. Yes, of course. From my point of view. Because that's where the real power was. Yeah. yeah. That, would, that constituted a paradigm shift, a profound. To, listen, I'll tell you how controversial his report was. If you go back and look at the January 22nd, 1969 cover of the New York Times, there were two headlines. One was about the newly inaugurated president of the United States, Richard Nixon. The other one, the other headline read, Harvard Report calls for degree in Negro studies. <laughs> yes. Well, That's we were amazing. Negroes back then. Right. Well, and Tommy, we, we, we ought to have that framed Negro. and put in, put in the locker room. It was a big deal. <laughs> That's right. Uh, uh... Orlando. From they were all students. Henry was on the faculty. You were coming and integrating the sociology um, department and helping to build the department ostensibly. Could you describe your first impressions of the fledgling Afro-American Studies Department when you arrived to teach in 1970? Orlando, when did you arrive? January 1970. Mm -hmm. As a faculty member. As a, as a visiting faculty yeah. member, yeah. Um, Good and bad. Yes. Um, we're in a celebratory mood, so I have to play it on the bad. <laughs> and, um, but oh, first of all, I was coming from um, London School of Economics by the University of West Indies, where I was um, a student, uh, undergraduate. Um, my growing up in a black society, in a black university, I mean, I grew up with what you call African American studies. <laughs> you know, we were studying uh, black history, Caribbean history, slavery, and all these things which they were fighting for. Yeah, but tell the audience but, where, where you went to school. As an undergraduate, University of the West Indies, uh, then a College of London, and then the London School of Economics. And so my first job was on the faculty of the London School of Economics, straight out of graduate school. Right. And then I quit that and out of political commitment, because I was pretty radical at then. I think I still am, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, I quit my job at LSE to go back to the Caribbean to help in, in newly formed nation develop and so on. And, um, um, so when I read about what was happening here, I was um, quite excited uh, about it. And, um, um, wanted to be involved in some way. Initially, I was mainly interested in just coming and visiting and experiencing it. And, um, and so um, I um, expressed my interest and uh, was invited uh, to come over. Um, and, you know, I found uh, a situation which is just um, still, it was still form forming. Um, there's still in Harvard, um, the, the, um, the noise and the concern and I hadn't settled from the previous semester when we had the big um, bust or takeover of um, University Hall. So people are still recovering from that and so on. But this is the first year of the department and um, I was um, very happy with um, what I found initially, um, and the faculty there were very welcoming. If from Isaacs, I remember, um, just loaned me his car to drive around Cambridge, which was not a good idea. <laughs> because 
of um, all the one-way streets in Cambridge. I was lost I mean, uh, within five minutes. But, and you were uh, driving on the wrong side of the I road. I was driving on the wrong side of the road. <laughs> but um, um, it was a welcoming environment. Um, I was especially happy with Ephraim's work. He works in slavery. Um, so did I. Uh, Noah Four and, um, and others. Uh, and so I thought, you know, we were really at the beginning of something very exciting. And um, uh, it was easy for me since, in a way, the courses I was teaching just fitted naturally here. Yep. Um, slavery, Caribbean society, Caribbean literature, and so on. And um, um, so we were very happy there in Dunster Street for a while. Um, I was began to get worried about the very negative view of the department um, outside. You know, there are people are saying unpleasant things. I mean, the, the Times is um, expressing amazement, but others weren't um, anything as um, um, quiet about their views. One described it as a deformed academic baby that should be thrown out with the bathwater. The Boston, the, yeah, the Boston Globe uh, called it a Potemkin village. Um, so it, it was not uh, the easiest of, or, or very nicest of reception. But um, I like the energy of the students, and um, I really enjoyed teaching in a, an American university for the first time. I did, however, um, very soon, and I should be quite clear about this, have um, uh, some concerns. I, um, um, my biggest problem, let me be completely um, uh, honest, um, was with the chair. Mm -hmm. um, I, um, I was puzzled um, when I realized he was not really a scholar. Yeah. I wonder why Harvard had done that. And this created, this is, it is unfair, I think, for the department of students. It is unfair to, 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 to you, what, to Gwinear. Um, he was a union man. And um, I don't know why Howard made that decision. There were lots of, um, I say it was one of the mistakes it made, if you want to be honest, because there are lots of very good scholars even then. You know, I mean, I, I kept wondering, what happened to John Hope Franklin? What happened to any well, number of other Well, I'll tell scholars. you what happened to John Hope Franklin. I tried to recruit him. They tried to recruit him, but the, his own department, John Hope Franklin, was, let's see, let's count. In the history department, Du Bois got, was the first black person to get a PhD at Harvard in history. Mm -hmm. Carter G. Woodson was second. Uh, Charles Wesley, Rayford Logan, and I think John Hope Franklin was the fifth. Black person to get a PhD in history. I, I could have left someone out, but I think I'm right. I think that's right. The history department turned him down. Ah. When? When he was offered to, when he was recruited, because it's a story he loved to tell. He prided himself on keeping Cornell West from accepting his offer, and William Joyce Wilson from accepting two of his <laughs> offers, because he felt so insulted that the history department would not give him an appointment when he was offered the chairmanship. He, and he proudly said this place was doomed to fail, <laughs> because his own department yeah. had turned him I out. see, yeah. I see. Well, that, that. You're saying in the context of being invited to come and run the department, but not the he history department at that time turn, yeah. turned him down. He won, I think, about yes, the kind yeah. of politics you need to understand. Yes, yeah. that's but, amazing. Yeah. I mean, that would be like, I don't know, you get, a P, you get a PhD in your own department, they created it, and then they, they won't give you, make you a voting member of that department. That was the biggest insult that one could do. Yeah, know. yeah. Uh, that was And John Hope wasn't all that crazy. He loved, he, John Hope to his dying day called himself a Southern historian, as Evelyn would say if she were here. And he was very proud of that, and that was a political thing in the uh, historiography uh, establishment for yeah. him to identify himself this way. But obviously he loved African American history. He wrote from Slavery and Freedom, which is a Bible for everybody in here who took any kind of black history class in our day, and Evelyn Higginbotham has essentially rewritten it, and it still sells uh, tens of thousands of copies today. But he couldn't come here yeah. on an equal footing. It would be right, as if yeah. Harvard did not give me an appointment in the English department, which they did when I was recruited, because my PhD is in the English department. Right. So that was the deal. He said no. Well, that was tragic, because as I said, you know, um, 
um, you know, it was um, basically um, a union man, and he was not really qualified for that position. And his, he took, um, he politicized the situation uh, too much. But we uh, who were there uh, made the best of it. I myself, I mean, we, we personally just didn't get on with him. Yeah. And, um, uh, but I certainly enjoyed teaching uh, the, uh, the courses that I did. Uh, among my first students in my Caribbean course uh, was Ruth Simon. Really? Yeah, who um, later became as you know, president of um, Brown and Smith College and so on. So we had great students. And um, I enjoyed um, being part of that um, um, early process. But then you seceded from the union. Well, I had to because basically I just did not get, I'm a, I, I, I'm a cantankerous Jamaican, and he is a, he's a union man, okay. and a union man and a Jamaican meeting, and I'm afraid, I mean, <laughs> the sparks were flying almost every day. I mean, we, 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 just, we just did not hit it off. Um, so I continued teaching my courses, but um, uh, went over uh, to sociology. But uh, I remained very much involved with the department because, I mean, I remember I was um, visiting Cambridge, um, University, when Bach came to see me and um, said, you know, your old department uh, needs your help. Um, we're really having a serious problem. This is about 78 or so. Uh -huh. And um, so I was on that first committee right. um, for trying to restore the department. That's when um, um, we appointed Werner. Yep, and Nathan. And Nathan. And um, uh, the economist, um, Lowry. Glenn Lowry. Glenn yes. Lowry, yes. I remember well, I mean, you know, and then, so we thought that was a pretty good team, sure. but then didn't quite work out. It, um, didn't work so out. it was initially very good, um, they, but they, Glenn, they, Glenn seceded from the Glenn year. seceded. <laughs> um, Glenn went far right and seceded. And, um, and um, the, um, it, it moved along, but then the tragedy of um, Nathan dying prematurely, so young and so on. And then I, we were asked again at that point, we were down to one person, yeah. um, Werner. And um, the, the, the president came again and said, you know, you're on a committee, me and Martin, and um, um, a couple of other people, Leonard and so on, to find something, find someone, um, and this time make, it, make sure you find someone good. And I should mention Bach. Uh, Bach. Bach deserves to be mentioned on this because Bach was determined also, along with Henry and so on, yes. that we we're going to get it right. In other words, it could easily have taken the position, okay. look, we've tried, we failed twice, let's just wrap it up. It okay. was the last year of Derek Bach's 20-year presidency. And yes. He was determined. He knew this was a blot on his record. Right. And he had to do something. Yeah. Um, he actually chaired the meeting. Let yeah. me, I mean, that story I know very well. Mm -hmm. He, it was the last year, and uh, I forgot actually the, the dean of FAS had suddenly dis disappeared. It may have been Mike Sp I don't remember who no, it Mike was. Mike Spence. Yeah, it and was Mike. And he went to Stanford. Yeah. To business school. And I went back for one year to, uh, so that Derek and I would sort of finish together. And when he asked me and I accepted, I thought, you know, it would be a year of drinking sherry, <laughs> leisurely dinners. <laughs> but, you know, Derek is a real Protestant. <laughs> uh, I am not. <laughs> and he said to me, you know, we have to accomplish something this year. <laughs> I blanched. <laughs> and he said to me, what is the worst problem in FAS? And I said, you know, it is to really rescue the African American Studies Department because there was no leadership. He said, this is what we're going to fix. And it was a very busy year, and you told part of the story. And at the end, we got Henry Louis Gates. 
So what else is there to say? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry that Derek isn't here to take a bow because he deserves yeah. it. I'm yeah. sorry he's not to. Thank you. Well, it was a blessing for me, and it's been a blessing uh, every day since the day of my appointment. But it might, you know, Tommy um, said, uh, <laughs> no one's ever accused me of being a radical, <laughs> which is true. Um, <laughs> but I also had thought, a lot about the history of disciplines, the institutionalized disciplines. You know, when you're a student, you think that God or Plato created all these departments. All these departments have a history. They're all socially constructed. Uh, sociology, I mean, you, you studied philosophy if you were Du Bois with James in the philosophy department. I mean, you studied psychology with James in the philosophy department because like, psychology didn't exist. Sociology didn't exist, that's why Du Bois went to Berlin. All these um, <clears throat> departments were created by somebody and probably often in a fight. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that was um, obvious to me about the, the um, history of African, what we now call African American studies, was that there had been too many departments that depended too much on ideology. That you had to think a certain way to, or be black a certain way. Mm -hmm. and we, Anthony and I operate on the principle, nobody's going to ask you how you voted if you're up for an appointment in the math department. Nobody's going to ask you um, what party you're in if you're up for an appointment in the chemistry department. Why should that be relevant? You'd be surprised. Oh, really? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least that was my yeah. fantasy. <laughs> <laughs> and we have, we have stuck to that principle. I mean, yeah. we, we have people on, in the center not really on the right. Um, everybody's on the right of certain people in the department. I ain't called no names. I told my students, if I ever want to know where the left is, I just turned and there's my man Cornell West, right, <laughs> right there. And, and that's where he should be. Um, but the point is, we had to build it on the firmest academic grounds and not on uh, passing fads of ideology and what it meant to be black in yeah. somebody's mind at any particular point. And that has been um, a fundamental principle of the last uh, 30 years. Yeah. One Hello. critical, one critical um, period was between 72 and 73 academic year, because um, there is another meeting committee, um, which after the you know, by the 1970s, it was clear that, you know, we had to do something again. And a com another committee was set up. Um, and um, uh, I remember I wrote a long um, a memo to them, so did Martin Kilson and others. That committee, there's a, um, a faculty meeting in, end of, um, in December 72 to discuss um, the department and where we're going to go. And um, it was at that meeting that certain basic decisions were made. One was that um, we would um, go back to um, not having students make decisions about faculty appointments. Because that had turned out to be problematic. A lot of faculty people simply were not interested in coming to a department in which students had a say in appointing faculty and even in promotion to tenure. Right. So, I mean, um, so they did that. Uh, there was a recommendation um, that the department should be a joint department. Interestingly, there's a long debate you know, over, over that. Um, Kilson was strongly pushing for that. A joint department? Yes, that it should um, be more something like Eastern Literature or something like I that. Uh -huh. and, um, and interestingly, um, the faculty turned it down. Um, and uh, with a vote, I think it was 69-59, almost ended up. So they remained an autonomous department. But what they did do is to put it on a, a more regular footing, similar to other departments at Harvard. Right. The mo most important one being that students would not participate in faculty appointments. Which was a very important, the only way no. it was going to have any status. And, okay, was and I them. should say, the students all supported that. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah? Yes. They, um, there was no protest to that. That, that. that was a big yeah, change. You know, I thought that was a terrible mistake when it occurred. And I think it 
retarded the development of the department. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and clearly, I mean, all students think they should have a right to vote on tenure. Yeah. And no faculty member right. <laughs> does. It, so that's, well, it's, it's not so simple. I mean, <laughs> even non-tenured faculty members don't have the right of course. to vote, you know, so it is. Sure. They used to do this in medieval universities, actually. Oh, really? Yes. So it was a return to the Middle Ages doing that. I mean, I, 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 <laughs> At which university? <laughs> oh, all the great European universities, students, in fact, hired their teachers. At, at yeah. Oxford at, and Cambridge? At Oxford Cambridge. and Paris, yeah. How many people were there, 12? I mean, yeah, you know, I mean. <laughs> they were trying to... <laughs> Octavia. Yes. Um, this was the era of black power, but also it was the dawn of black feminism. And I'm wondering um, how it was for you to see them playing out in the day-to-day -day activities and atmosphere on campus. How did they, these two big issues affect you and the choices that, that you were making or being asked to make? I mean, the most honest answer is not much. <laughs> in the sense that I, um, in my read of history, movements um, come to fore for a lot of different reasons. And um, even going back to um, Frederick Douglass mm -hmm. and his whole relationship with the women's movement. Seneca it, Falls, 1948. Yeah, and, and, and the politics of it. Mm -hmm. It became a question of who was going to get the vote first, That's blacks right. or the suffragettes. And my point in bringing that up is, is it, became, it becomes political gamesmanship. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't sure how much the feminist movement was that as well yes. during my, our time. Right. I don't have any problems with um, men leading when they know what they're doing. I mean, <laughs> I mean, if they're doing a good job, what's the point of saying that just because I'm a woman, I should be there? Sure. And so I, I never bought into it on that level. Now, and I always um, felt that, for instance, people, even in the history that we've just given, um, before we even had the Rosofsky Committee, Jeff and his group, had, um, and, and the men had done this. I, I don't want to take any credit that's not due. They had, had had different people go around talking to various faculty people and, um, and asking them to decide, you know, to get a feel for who was who. And I don't know if you remember, but there was a young lady called Cheryl Wynn who came to talk to you. And she came back yeah. to the group and she talked about your appreciation of jazz and what, um, and how interested you were in that. Now, she did question whether or not you would be interested in a department in the same way that you questioned it yourself. Because he wasn't. It was, because he wasn't, right? But she, had, she was interested. And, 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 and as a, maybe this is a feminist issue. I don't know what. But what had happened was the group then had a, um, if a person who had interviewed the person didn't think that they were interested in, the, in um, African American studies as a department, that we shouldn't recommend them, we shouldn't go to them. Right. And Cheryl liked you very much, but she thought that you weren't interested in a department. Mm -hmm. And, but Jeff and the guys decided that um, you should be on there anyway, <laughs> on that list anyway. And um, the women kind of got over to the other side and thought, well, you know, that's the only person, you know, but Cheryl, to not get into feminist, Cheryl was very soft-spoken. She was very soft-spoken. So the question becomes whether or not that was something that was done because she was feminist, or, I mean, I'm not that soft-spoken. If it had been me, <laughs> whether there would have been a different outcome. So my point, it, to try to answer your question as honestly as possible, is that I, I've never bought into the movement that way. I think that men and women are different in many ways, and and with all due respect, some of the stuff that men do, why would women want to do it? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and so I, I think that it's more important to keep focused on what is the goal and what are the different skills and, and talents that people bring to make that goal happen, as opposed to getting off on, 
um, whether it's, it's women or, or race or whatever, if we need to be able to, to, to check into our humanity in a way that doesn't make us abdicate our culture, whether we're talking about culture of women, culture of a group, whatever group culture we're talking about. Orlando, before we, we, we're going to open it up to the audience, and there will be microphones propped up in the aisle, right? Um, why, talk about the creation of the Du Bois Institute. Yeah. Because the inner politics, the, the institute was set up not to complement the department, but to separate. Martin Kilson was very adamant about the institute being a place of intellectual integrity as far as he was concerned, as opposed to the ideological battles going on in the department. That's mm -hmm. the way he would tell, yes. that he would tell the story. Sadly, he's not here to tell right. the story. Right. Well, I knew him very well. We, we were friends up to a certain point, yes. Yeah. Um, look, the interesting thing was that the original um, statement, uh, memorandum on the department from the very beginning it suggested the formation of the Du Bois Institute. I right. struck by that. I mean, it was, it was um, so, it, and the idea, it was all well laid out that it should be within the department uh, and that it should um, uh, promote um, the study of African American and African um, culture. Um, they, then it became a bone of contention whether it should be um, separated from um, certainly the, um, the directorship of the um, chair of the department. Guinier assumed that he would be head. Yes, of course. And um, there was a huge fight in the faculty meeting. I can still hear Guinier sort of um, yelling um, uh, to Leonard that Leonard um, would share the committee recommending um, um, that the directorship of the department should not necessarily be the chair. Uh, Guinier said that, you know, you had a white perspective. and. Um, and in the faculty, club, faculty meeting, the first and maybe the only time, Leonard shouted back, you're a damn liar. <laughs> <laughs> Words like that have not been heard in the Harvard uh, faculty meeting what since. What year was this? This would have been 72, December, okay. that meeting. And the artist bank has decided that we would, yes, um, uh, support the department, but that um, uh, it needed money. Where the funds and another controversy emerged out of that, by the way, um, uh, the Ford Foundation had expressed interest in supporting it, and um, Dunlop, who was then dean, yes. um, had a meeting with um, with the uh, Ford people, Hughes, I think his name was, and came back and informed Guinier that Ford's position was yes, we support it, but only on condition that it's a university-wide. Um, department, institution. Right. That turned out, some people did some investigation. <laughs> it turned out to be, uh, Dunlop being is very tricky, um, uh, you know, he was quite a character. Right. It turned out it was not entirely so, and the, 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 the Ford Foundation person actually issued a statement saying, that's not what is not his business to inform Harvard how it runs this institution. What it did say was that, um, it will support the Du Bois Institute, but on the assumption that when the money ran out, Harvard would continue to support it. Right. That gave Guinier some firepower, as you can imagine, but it didn't do uh, much good. And so the, um, uh, Derek decided that he would um, take it over because he was very committed to it. Yes. And, um, and committed to African American studies, being very much involved, but that he would take it out of the hands of um, Guinier. Yeah. So that's how he ended up, um, um, in a sense, he, running he, the committee. He not only did it, but endowed it. So that when yeah. Anthony and I came, it had an endowment of yeah. about $4 million already. I mean, we hit the ground running with $4 million at yeah. the bank. No, he was I very mean, that committed. Was a, that was a lot for a research. A lot of money then, yeah. And now it's considerably more, of course. Yeah. Um, OK, before we open it up, a last question for each of you. What, and let's we'll start with the lead. Um, 50 years, what are your hopes for the next 50 years of black <laughs> studies at Harvard? Well, this is a story. Um, I brought my uh, uh, grandnephew up to the uh, 50th anniversary of the 1958 Harvard-Yale game uh, last year. And 
um, my grandnephew was 14 years old. Um, we took a tour of the Harvard campus. I am not pushing him for Harvard. I just wanted him. He lives in New York City in, in Brooklyn. I wanted him to see a discreet, uh, traditional collegiate campus. And um, so we stopped in at the um, department. Nobody was there because, of course, it was the day before the Harvard-Yale game. But I picked up some material and um, the course catalog and started uh, reading through the course offerings. And for some of the courses, um, at first reading, I couldn't understand what they were about. Hmm. And you know, I had to kind of go into Harvard student mode and figure out what the course was about. And then I said, oh, OK. Uh, I have been out of the university for almost 50 years and uh, have been in the world of work. And so let me go into a, the mind of a scholar mode and figure out what they're trying to say in this course. And I'm happy to say I figured it out. <laughs> but uh, what I took from that was um, the course offerings, some of the course offerings are slightly esoteric to a layperson. And I said to myself, that's just the way it should be. <laughs> because some of the course offerings across the university are slightly, and perhaps more than slightly, esoteric to a layperson. Um, and since, as you know, I've been in touch with you all over the years, sure. uh, often. Um, and it was just another indication to me of you know, how healthy the department and the whole enterprise is doing as a layperson. Um, I would expect if you know, the world has another 50 years to live that the department will continue along that path, right? Exploring the, um, the deep, the depth of knowledge, right? That's, that's what a department, an academic department is supposed to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm exploring the depth of knowledge in subjects that to lay people, <laughs> some lay people, may be um, somewhat impenetrable on first reading, or maybe on second reading, or even on third reading. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> you know, by the way, <clears throat> when you all were deciding uh, about your position uh, 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 about department versus committee, American studies, now called American civil was a committee Itself, it wasn't um, sure. a department. Is American, is it not a department yet, is it? No. No. no, no, it's a committee. So, you know, that's by contrast, American studies, which I think in size, Afro M is, uh, we call it Afro, has dwarfed American studies in, in size, uh, and because, again, because of that departmental structure. How about you, Orlando? 50 years. What do you want to see the field become? You're very much an Afro American. Well, if the trajectory for the past 50 years continues in the next year, Harvard will be all black in, one year, in the 50 <laughs> years. <laughs> I mean, when I came here, I mean, you know, I, well, it's, it's interesting what you said. Um, last year, I also brought my grandson to visit Harvard. And uh, he's, a, he's a freshman here now. And what struck him was, here, this is there's black people all over the place. <laughs> and, um, it, you know, and it's a um, it complete contrast. Uh, I, there are two members of the faculty um, uh, of art and science, uh, myself and Martin, and we were joined about the same year um, by uh, the Plummer professor. Uh, now, you know, it's just a remarkable um, uh, thing to behold how many members of the faculty are involved with African American studies, and the, um, the 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 fact that it's integrated in a very powerful way in the um, intellectual life of the university, and the fact that the students themselves are now, as 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 Kim was saying, there's not just one black organization; there are 15 of them. That's how many. Um, the I did um, earlier this year uh, a lecture on. Um, uh, diversity at Harvard, the proportion of black students now at Harvard is about equivalent to their proportion in the nation. Right. And, and 
would have in fact been significantly higher had not one in three black students turned down Harvard. Harvard. Yes. Um, so it's just been a, 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 just a, a, a sea change. And at the present rate, I mean, I, you know, um, this is now the iconic department. This is now the department to emulate yes. uh, in the study of black, all over the world, not just America. I, I should say a word, too, about the person I don't think is here, but we will be celebrating his retirement, I think mourning his retirement in, in a month. But um, to, 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 just to stress what a difference an individual could make. I, uh, I was free bed. Yale did not have summer school. And I mentioned earlier, I was taking a year off to go to work in a hospital in Africa. So I came here right after the big May Day strike um, in the summer of 1970 to take inorganic chemistry and calculus. And I was staying in Wigglesworth Hall, and I, I walked out into the square, and there's this black dude who gets out of this Jaguar XKE. Got a little bow tie on, you know? Cat man. And I, I said, wow, who are you? Amen. And he said, well, I have a master's degree in engineering from Princeton. I have ta I'm working in the space program at, at IBM in Alabama, and I've taken a leave of absence for a year to help Harvard find <laughs> um, uh, eligible, you know, competitive black kids <laughs> in its affirmative action program. And that person stayed um, here for the next 50 years and has ad admitted, uh, he didn't admit you guys, but he admitted Cornell West, and is, I think his count is just under 6,000 black students that David Evans, David Evans. Ha has admitted to Harvard College. So we have to give it up for that one. Jeff, 50 years from now. Um, I, I've always had this, this image in the back of my head, forefront of my consciousness, really, of black people finding their place in the sun. <laughs> and I thought that it would have happened by now. I am discouraged at the circumstances of black America in aggregate. Um, I developed an idea early on in my life and career that there had to be levers of change, that there were strategic things we could do and change. The idea of, 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 of graduate students being a lever for change for faculties. I thought there are things like that. Education struck me as one. I could go on about what I think they are. But for me, it was an important idea back then and continues today that there should be serious study, debate, argumentation among undergraduates at Harvard. I would like to see the department leading that about the levers of transformation of American society. What do we have to do? And it doesn't matter that anyone wins that fight during their four years here. What matters is that they think about it, that they talk about it, that they engage and go out into the world in, in pursuit of it. Now, I know that there's an engagement component to the department now. I don't know how central it is. I hope it's very central. But it seems to me that, that side by side with scholarship, um, really connected to scholarship, there needs to be a thrust for transformation of American society, starting with black folks and and expanding beyond that. When, 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 uh, when we recruited Cornell for the first time, um, you know, Cornell was chair of Afro Am at Princeton. So it was a huge thing for him to come. And I worked really hard to, to recruit him. It was, I happen to like Cornell, he's one of my best friends. I love Cornell and I admire him so much. But I said, there's one favor I want you to do for me and for the department. I want you to teach our introductory course to African American studies. And Cornell, first of all, it was <laughs> like it raised our enrollment up like 5,000%. <laughs> <laughs> but secondly, his course is all about that. And you should sit in on his lecture. And when we came, he came back, we asked him to teach it again. Because his course, he'll t talk to you about it later, is structured around 
the history of thought, but also the history of social transformation and the future of social transformation. You think that's a fair description, Brother Boyd? Very fair. Very fair. <laughs> Great. Octavian. You know, I, I thought about this question a little bit, and, and it's a difficult question for me to, to answer. And, and I think that part of the reason that it's difficult is because it isn't a question for our generation to answer. It's a question for generations to come to answer. But the, to the degree to which I've thought about it, I, I, I'm not sure that um, what Harvard can do in terms of specific kinds of things that Jeff talks about. I'm not even sure if Harvard is the place to do it. But what I do think Harvard can do is to help students find their place or what universities do well when they do it well to find out, use the time to figure out where you fit in best or what you want your career and your future to be. And as that relates to black people, um, um, particularly descendants of slaves in, in this country, um, we have not had, we, we come too much, I think, from a place of talking about our race and our hurt and what has happened to us. And I would like in the future for us to be, I mean, I, I think it's some kind of blasphemy to say this, but I'll say it anyway. I don't think that race is the biggest issue. I think that culture is much more the issue. Mm -hmm. And the degree to which Harvard and any scholarship can help us get past issue, I shouldn't say past issues of race because it's part of it, but to understand culture in the context of our greater humanity. Mm -hmm. if, it can, if we can use our experiences, our scholarship, so that students can come away from university hopefully connected to their culture and not disconnected mm -hmm. from it and not feeling that they have to mold themselves into something that even they don't recognize, but more importantly, disconnects them from people who help mold them into what's the best of them. Yeah. And so I don't know the answer to it, and I think it's the challenge of those who come after us mm -hmm. to try to figure out what's best for them and how to make the university um, part of that. Yeah, I think that you two would, you three students, <laughs> mm -hmm. would um, be interested to see the way class, mm -hmm. yeah. the, the role of class in right. the pedagogy within the department. Exactly is much more pronounced than it was 50 years ago, at least when I was a student. I was saying yes too fast. Point. Say that more, I, I didn't understand. Class analysis, more the interrelationship between ethnicity, or you know, race, class, quote right. unquote, ethnicity, and the, class. Yeah, okay, you know, I got that. If you think about point. the concept of a slave, that's race and class molded into one. Mm -hmm. Class has always been a fundamental part of the African and the African American experience. Right. Cornell's pioneered, not the only person in this room, but pioneered in the analysis of class with uh, race in, in our curriculum. Mm -hmm. Orlando writes about class all the time as, as well. And that will only increase in importance as inequality increases. But her, her contrast, I thought, was not she race and culture. class, race and culture. I know, that's why I'm giving a footnote. Which to me looks like a, an inward look into black culture as something that may be holding us back to some degree and as the engine for change in the long run. So I, I, I think I heard that differently. No. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't, it, when you look, I think it's very important to have some question of connecting yourself to humanity, doing good things. That's why I think it's very important to have someone on faculty like an Ephraim Isaac, so that you're talking about your spiritual health as well, okay? okay? So that if you're doing good things, it, it doesn't become a question of, or you're helping somebody other than yourself. And part of the difficulty of a culture, of an academic culture, is that you are pushed to project for yourself. You're supposed to talk about your particular um, smartness and your talented tenth and all of that kind of yeah, stuff right. that doesn't, that disconnects you from doing the good you can do. And, and there are good people of all races. There are good people of all cultures. The question becomes, how do you put those things together so that you're, not, you're talking about doing good? I mean, it's as simplistic as it sounds, but doing something 
for someone other than yourself and making the change you want to see in the world and understanding how culture can help that or culture can keep you from doing that. Our utmost importance. Final word, we're giving one minute. Well, I got the one minute sign. Sorry about that for, your <laughs> open, for the open mic. Final word from the dean. Dean no. All of you have much longer time horizon than I have. I can't look ahead 50 years. We can't can either. Uh, I, I can look back, yes. <laughs> I, uh, this department is today widely acknowledged to be the best in the country. I hope that that's true 50 years from now. What it will look like, I really have no idea. I hope that we will find right. people like you to uh, still be here and lead it. Thank you, brother. Ladies and gentlemen, let's thank Lee Daniels, Jeff Howard, Octavia Hudson, Orlando Patterson, and Henry Wisowski. Thank you. Thank you. It was great. <laughs>